tonight on Y News. The National Bureau of Investigation begins its probe on the kidnapping case of Korean national Ik Ju Ji in Angeles City, Pampanga. Authorities arrest two suspects in the killing of eight fishermen in Zamboanga City. Japanese Prime Minister Zinsho Abe arrives in the country for a two-day visit aiming at strengthening economic and diplomatic ties. And the mood is set for the 2016 Miss Universe pageant as arrival of candidates continues. Why News begins now. From the UNTV News and Rescue Command Center, this is Why News with Angelo Castro III and Darlene Basingan. Good evening. The National Bureau of Investigation is now investiga investigating the abduction of a Korean national in Pampanga, wherein a policeman from the, anti, uh, from the PNP Anti-Illegal Drugs Group is said to be involved. Roderick Mendoza will tell us why. The NBI National Capital Region and NBI Task Force Against Illegal Drugs are joining forces to look into the abduction of Korea National Ik Jo Ji in Angeles City, Pampanga last October 18. Three suspects, including a policeman from the PNP Anti-Illegal Drugs Group, have already been charged with kidnapping and serious illegal detention before the DOJ. But the victim's wife, Kyung Hin Choi, also requested the NBI to probe the incident. She claims that the suspects also took their personal property, jewelries, passports, and vehicle. We are investigating this case for the purpose of touching on the angle of kidnapping and the robbery and to identify other perpetrators of the crime using the war on drugs to extort money. NBI says it is too early to tell whether the incident is a case of tokhang for ransom since the victim, who is a former top executive of Hanjin Shipping Company, is not involved in illegal drugs. He's a legitimate businessman uh, working here and living in Angel City. The victim's wife is appealing to people who might have possibly seen the Korea national. Choi says the kidnappers failed to show proof that her husband is still alive when they delivered a 5 million peso ransom. The family is offering 100,000 pesos for any information that would help track down the victim. If is there someone who, who saw the picture of her husband and you, if you have seen him, please uh, contact us. They also called on the DOJ to fast track the resolution of the charges and the arrest of the suspects. Roderick Mendoza, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. Authorities have arrested two suspects in the killing of eight fishermen in Zamboanga City. Ray Pelayo will tell us why. Authorities arrested yesterday another suspect in the killing of eight fishermen in Sirimon Island, Panubigan, Zamboanga City. The suspect was identified as Arsani Samlani, a resident of Barangay Muti. Another suspect identified as Mitzfar Nuno was arrested the other day in a drug by bus operation. Eh, meron na tayong dalawang uh, suspect na nako na uh, yung una yung uh, nakuha sa seaside sanggali authorities suspect that extortion was the motive for the killings as well as revenge for the accused two other colleagues killed in an encounter with authorities last november however it remains unclear if the suspects have links to the abu sayyaf group Authorities are still hunting for the 10 companions of the suspects, including Nasser Saipudin, Aming Mundalis, Alvin Sankula, Jobert Kabe, and RJ Papa. We continue yung ating mga ginagawa nga, lalong-lalo na in addressing sa mga lawless elements, criminal elements, and uh, uh, member of the threat groups na pumapasok dito sa ating area para gumawa ng hindi maganda. The Zamboanga City Police has already ordered its station commanders to intensify the monitoring of the city, particularly the coastline areas, to prevent the repeat of the incident. 
Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Some lawmakers want, <clears throat> want to investigate the plan <clears throat> to increase the contributions of Social Security System or SSS members alongside the implementation of a hike in monthly pension. Nel Maribok will tell us why. The plan of the Social Security System or SSS to increase by 1.5% the monthly premium contribution of its members is illegal. According to representatives of marginalized sectors in the lower house, it is unreasonable to members of SSS who are still paying contributions to shoulder the funding of the hike in monthly pension of its retired members. They questioned where the earnings of the state insurance company go when it should have been allocated for the pension increase. Because of this, the lawmakers will investigate the said agency. I think it's time we also... Uh, study talaga this 1.5% increase uh, sa SSS. The 1.5% uh, increase in premium, to my mind, might be too much for the employers. We have to put a balance in it. I agree with the, with the premise of the question that it's about time that we should investigate the SSS of that. Because in fact, now that the capacity of SSS is being questioned, SSS Chairman Amado Valdez has initially said that the plan increase in members' contributions is within the bounds of the law and that he is open to any investigation that would be conducted on the said increase. Maganda yung pag-iimbestiga para maliwanagan natin kung ano-ano mga dapat na gawin. Pero marami ng mga investigasyon na nagawa eh. Ang panahon na para magtrabaho tayo. Hindi yung salisalita lang. Malacanang, meanwhile, emphasizes anew that President Duterte has studied the hike in monthly SSS pension and the planned increase in contributions of its members very well. Palace notes that the 1.5% increase in SSS contributions will also help expand the investment reserve and pension fund of the agency that would later help it fulfill its obligations in the near future. Nel Maribuhok, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Senators have given themselves two months starting next week to pass all identified priority bills this year. Joyce Balancho will tell us why. Majority floor leader Senator Vicente Soto III assures that the Senate is ready for the reopening of sessions as they have already named out their priority legislations for this year. These include bills that have been sponsored on the floor, such as the Freedom of Information Bill, the proposed granting of the emergency powers to the President, the expanded Soto Law for media practitioners, Coco Levy, and the proposed amendments to the Anti-Money Laundering Act. During the caucus yesterday, each senator was asked for their pet bills, which Soto defined as those measures that are not controversial and contentious. Among them are the upgrade in the anti-hazing law, filed by Senator Soto, the Budget Reform Advocacy for Village Empowerment Act of Senator Panfilo Lacson, and Senator Grace Post's proposal for a feeding program in public elementary schools. Next week, the Senate will resume its session in which they will tackle these priority bills that they aim to pass in the first two months of this year. Meanwhile, some senators have denied their fellow colleague Senator J.V. Ejercito's statement that some are not satisfied with Senator Pimentel's stint as Senate President. Senator Tito Soto and Ba Makino deny rumors that there is a brewing plot to oust Pimentel. That's not true. I have not heard that it's only now. Sa pagkakakilala ko sa mga sama ko mga senador, eh, isa na ako sa mga unang makakaalam niyan. Meron ganyan. To be honest, no, I have not heard of those. Uh, wala namang usapan o chatter among the senators. So, you know, I guess being in a political atmosphere, highly politically charged, may mga ganyang lumalabas-labas. In separate statements, Senator Laila De Lima and Risa Hontivero say they are not privy to such plans. De Lima even expressed her confidence in Pimentel as the leader of the High Chamber. I know him to be really a good, honest, and decent person and therefore a good, honest and decent leader. He used to be a client of mine. So I, I know, kilala ko pagkatao ni, ni uh, SP Coco. Joyce Balancho, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. Former Senator Ramon Bong Revilla Jr. is disappointed with the slow progress of his plunder case at the Sandigan Bayan. Monokson will tell us why. 
siyempre, na-expect natin na mas mapabilis eh, no? para matapos na to. Pero parang yung tatagal pa eh. Former Senator Bong Revilla was disappointed because it seems that the plunder case against him is taking a long time to resolve. Revilla has been detained for more than two years and this is the first time the court will hear his PDAF case. From the PNP Custodia Center, Revilla personally attended the hearing of his plunder case in the Sandigan Bayan today. The Graf Court was scheduled to determine the pretrial order of Revilla for it to move to the actual hearings. The camp of Revilla was prepared, but the prosecution has appealed that they be allowed to amend some sections in the pre-trial order. Revilla's camp also questioned the more than 100 witnesses that the prosecution wants to present. According to the defense, if all the 119 witnesses will be presented, it will take them a long time to finish the case. Aside from Attorney Ramon Esguera, the former lawyer of Chief Justice Corona, Revilla also retained the services of Attorney Estelito Mendoza, the former lawyer of Senator Enrile. Meanwhile, Revilla's wife Bacoor Cavite Bayer Lani Mercado is holding on to the assistance promised them by President Rodrigo Duterte during the campaign. Binanggit niya sa amin yon a few years ago prior, uh, during his visit uh, sa amin nung nangangampanya siya. Uh, kung ano, pero naniniwala ako sa sinasabi niya na we have go, to go and pass through the process of, of law. So yan ang ginagawa natin ngayon. Also present at the hearing was Revilla's co-accused and chief of staff, Richard Cambe. The Sandigan Bayan reset the hearing of the plunder case to February 19. Mon Hoxon, UNTV News and Rescue, Sandigan Bayan. Authorities ensure that security concerns are well addressed for the ASEAN Summit 2017. Victor Cosare tells us why. Emergency medical responders from different areas of Davao region have been gathered in Davao City for the ASEAN 2017. More than 500 trained rescuers were deployed today at 11 staging areas around the city so they could quickly respond in case a situation arises. These areas are located near the venue of the summit and also at the billeting areas of the delegates. Uh, position to, uh, to make sure that within five minutes, nandun na sila sa mga billet areas and uh, your main activity area. Aside from the ASEAN summit, the rescue teams are also on standby during the Japanese Prime Minister's visit to Davao City and also of some candidates of the Miss Universe pageant on the 19th. Hindi lang po natural, we will also uh, oversee yung kung mayroong mangyayari mga human reduce hazard. Kung may mga sakun na mangyayari. Uh, we are not praying for that, no? we are just preparing kung sakali. No? Earlier this week, members of the security forces have also been deployed to key areas in the city in preparation for the ASEAN summit. But one concern raised by authorities is the traffic problem on some of Davao City's main arteries. That is why they continue to conduct inspections and clearing operations to get rid of obstructions. Uh, basically, yung mga unfinished projects, we have been uh, following them up to finish and complete these uh, diggings. And if they cannot complete, they should put steel plates. The full force of the traffic police and its augmentation force will also be deployed to manage the traffic situation in the city. Victor Cosare, UNTV News and Rescue, Davao City. The mood is set for the 2016 Miss Universe pageant as candidates arrive. Rina Villamor Camara will tell us why. In today's arrival list were Miss Nicaragua, Miss Costa Rica, Miss British Virgin Island, Miss Canada, and Miss USA, who arrived with Paula Sugart, the president of Miss Universe Organization. Um, we went to Sargal and we went to numerous resorts on the island, so we had a chance to really tour around and get a feel for all the locals. So it was it was wonderful to be able to see everyone. They're all so kind and sweet here. Fifteen years I've been waiting for this moment. So and how great I'm sure it is. I'm so happy, really happy to be here. Miss Vietnam was also among those who arrived today. She was sport enough to speak a few Tagalog phrases in front of the media. Salamat po, Philippines! Thank you! <laughs> Meanwhile, 
Miss Switzerland was supposed to arrive today, but her flight was moved to tomorrow as she was not feeling well. More candidates have arrived this afternoon, including Miss Singapore, Miss Czech Republic, Miss Poland, Miss Slovak Republic, Miss Argentina, Miss Belgium, Miss Chile, Miss Uruguay, Miss Cayman Island, Miss Great Britain, Miss India, and Miss Australia. Department of Tourism under Secretary Kat de Castro in an interview today says the preparation is almost complete and she is set to meet Miss Universe President Paula Sugar to discuss about the judges, the performers, and the hosts of the main event, which will be held on January 30 at the Mall of Asia Arena. Meanwhile, the pageant will miss countries such as Greece, Ghana, Ireland, El Salvador, Lebanon, Montenegro, and Serbia as they did not send any representative for this year. Here's Miss Universe. PNP Highway Patrol Group prepares for any threats of disturbances during Miss Universe pageant activities in the country. Grace Cassin will tell us why. PNP Highway Patrol groups have received reports of possible disturbance threats from different groups amid activities of Miss Universe pageant. That is why they have already deployed 79 personnel across different regions in the country, especially in Vigan, Boracay, Cebu, Baguio, Batangas, Davao, and some parts of Metro Manila that will be visited by the candidates. There are several no, various threats na na receive naman na pwedeng manggulo. So, very preemptive na lang, no? Pinipreempt natin yung ma ma maaring mangyari. PNPHPG is responsible for convoy escort and traffic management for 88 candidates from January 1 to February 2. They will provide special routes for the convoy of the candidates, but they will also designate alternate routes for motorists and assures that there will be no road closures. Sinisigurado naman natin na during the time, talagang yung EDSA magiging maayos, no? In coordination also with the IAC. Of course, with MMDA. Working together with PNPHPG is the Police Security and Protection Group or PSPG that are assigned to be closed in security of the candidates. Grace Kasin, UNTV News and Rescue, Camp Krame. The Miss Universe 2016 parade in Baguio City is seen to make the city's flower festival start early. Marge Navarro will tell us why. A parade similar to the Baguio City Flower Festival is now being organized for the Miss Universe 2016 candidates. Thus, four colorful floats are being prepared for them accompanied by a series of street dancing during the parade. The parade will showcase the third best festival in the Philippines. Uh, the usual thing that anybody will see in a Baguio Flower Festival parade will we'll all be present during the 18th. Reigning Miss Universe Pia Wurzbach will be on board a float that will be designed based on the first clubhouse of the Baguio Country Club in 1905. Meanwhile, the three other floats will be for this year's Miss Universe candidates. The designs are based on the traditional festivals in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Mainly, if we have the design already, um, tapos schedule the hat. Uh, sabi ko sa inyo, 15 days on the framing and construction or structural, uh, mga welders, labor, carpentry, papasok sila. After a certain period of time, uh, pagtapos na lahat, out sila, pasok naman ang departamento ng mga florist. Fresh flowers like orchids, stargazers, casablanca, lilies and anthuriums are among the varieties that will be used to design the floats. Branches from fallen and damaged trees due to the onslaught of Typhoon Lawin will also be used for the design. The organizers assure that the floats are of high quality and are safe to use. Palaging nasa high level ang quality eh, and then the details even though yung iba kasi from a farm um, yung sinusundan talaga namin ang principles and elements of designing. Kaya kahit saan mo tignan, sa taas man, sa baba man, ano, makikita mong kung gaano ka detalye. The floats are expected to be fully ready on January 16 or two days before the arrival of the candidates in Baguio City. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Next in Y News. 
The United States and Japan still secures the trust of most Filipinos based on the latest Pulse Asia survey. The Department of Energy continues to find ways to prevent price shocks due to Malampaya shutdown. Y News will be right back. are guaranteed good with Kuya Danielle and the lively GMK Bunch. Good morning, Kuya! Good morning, Kuya! Good morning, Kuya! Bringing you the day's forecast. Pataan, Mindoro, Palawan, Ma. The latest happenings. Ito po ngayon ay nag-aalaga sa presyo 37 pesos per kilo. Good food. Helpful advice. Ingatan mo ang iyong puso sapagkat dinadaluyan ng buhay. Mas una-una dapat malinis. Maganda kuha tayo ng antibacterial. So, and everything you need to know to break up everyday living. Good morning, Kuya. Weekdays at 4.45 a.m. Good morning! Kung dati pasan nila ang problema... Ang dumami ng alaga ay eh, ni sabi pa ga, mag-share tayo sa kapwa. Ngayon, bahagi na sila ng solusyon. Salamat ko po lagi sa Diyos na binigyan niya ako lagi ng lakas, na mga platupad ko po lahat ng mga pangarap ko. Tapos sana po tuloy-tuloy rin po akong makatulong sa aking mga kapwa. Ang mga naturuan ng mabuting gawa. Natuto ng lumingap sa kapwa. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is welcomed by the Duterte cabinet during his arrival today for a two-day official visit. Joanna will tell us why. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe arrived in the country at 2.45 p.m. via Japan Air Force for a two-day official visit. The Prime Minister is accompanied by his wife, Madam Aki Abe, and several Japanese businessmen. They were welcomed by several members of the Duterte cabinet, including Executive Secretary Salvador Meljaldea, Foreign Affairs Secretary Perfecto Yasai, Japanese Ambassador to the Philippines Kazuhide Ishikawa, and several other officials. Upon his arrival, the Chief Executive of Japan was welcomed by the Malacanang Honor Guards. After the welcome ceremony, the delegation of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe immediately went to Malacanang to meet with President Rodrigo Duterte. Abe is set to travel to Davao City tonight as part of his visit. Among the places the Japan head of state will visit are the Mintal Elementary School at a cemetery in Barangay Mintal where many Japanese nationals killed before and during the World War II are buried. The Japanese Chamber of Commerce in Mindanao, meanwhile, is hoping that the economic ties of Japan and Philippines will further strengthen with the visit of the Japanese Prime Minister. Prime Minister Abe is the first head of state to visit Davao City and the country during the term of President Duterte. Joan Nano, UNCV News and Rescue, Pasay City. Five memorandums of agreement were signed between the Philippines and Japan during the official visit of Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in the country. Meanwhile, both Asian leaders expressed support for each other in addressing major challenges in Southeast Asia. Rosalie Kos will tell us why. This afternoon, five agreements are signed between the governments of the Philippines and Japan as part of enhancing the bilateral relationship of the two countries. Before the MOA signing, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was welcomed by President Duterte and his cabinet in Malacanang Palace grounds. The two immediately proceeded to a meeting wherein they expressed support for each other in addressing various challenges in Southeast Asia, such as terrorism and maritime security. 
As proven friends and long-time partners, the Philippines and Japan are committed to further expand and deepen our relations across a broad range of areas. We had an active discussion on enhancing our maritime and security cooperation. As maritime nations, the Philippines and Japan have a shared interest in keeping our waters safe and secure from threats of any kind. Among the agreements signed by the two governments are the economic and social development aid for the Philippines amounting to 1 trillion yen or around 427 billion pesos in five years' time. This includes financial grant for high-speed boats and other counter-terrorism equipment. Next is the Memorandum of Cooperation on the Low Carbon Growth Partnership, Memorandum of Cooperation between the Philippines and the Japanese Coast Guard, Memorandum of Cooperation for Road Traffic Information System, and Loan Agreement and Guarantee Letter for Harnessing Agribusiness Sector in Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao or ARMM. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Abe expresses his support to the anti-drug war of President Duterte and commits to help the Philippine government through aid for the rehabilitation treatment programs. President Duterte, in turn, articulates his gratefulness to Prime Minister Abe for Japan's continuous assistance in promoting prosperity and peace in Mindanao. During the joint press statements of the two chief executives, Prime Minister Abe said he chose the Philippines as his first destination this year as a testament of his primary emphasis on the bilateral relationship of Japan to the Philippines. A state banquet was prepared by President Duterte for Prime Minister Abe and his delegation this evening before the Prime Minister's departure to Davao City. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanang. The United States still will enjoy the trust of most Filipinos. Aga Kakbay will tell us why. The United States and Japan remain the most trusted countries by most Filipinos. This is the result of the latest survey released by Pulse Asia based on December 2016 nationwide survey on public trust to selected countries and international organizations. USA got the highest trust rating with 76%, followed by Japan with 70%, and Great Britain with 39%. Few Filipinos, meanwhile, trust Russia and China. The survey shows that 61% of the respondents distrust China, while 58% distrust Russia. The survey was conducted among 1,200 Filipinos from December 6 to 11 of 2016 through face-to-face -face interview. Some of the important events before the survey was conducted were the election of Donald Trump as the 45th U.S. President and the congratulatory call of President Duterte to Trump as well as his pronouncement to no longer lash out at the U.S. since it was the real estate who won the elections there. Aga Akba, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The Department of Energy is currently studying ways to prevent additional charges in power rates brought on by the Malampaya maintenance shutdown. Nel Maribohok will tell us why. The temporary shutdown of Malampaya operation would mean the possibility of a power rate increase. Natural power gas plants that are dependent on Malampaya will need to use more expensive diesel to generate power. Malampaya supplies 30 to 40 percent of the power demands in Luzon region. According to Energy Undersecretary Fentebella, Energy Secretary Alfonso Cusi asked the Energy Regulatory Commission to find possible prevention of price shocks. Tinitingnan maigi kung kasali na bayan sa PSA. Pangalawa, tinitingnan din po natin 
kung merong dapat ibalik ang Meralco na rebate sa ating mga consumer and we should not wait na isama pa yan dito sa March billing na expectation natin from this malampaya uh, scheduled maintenance shutdown. Based on Meralco simulation, for residential consumers who use 200 kilowatts per month, an additional 200 to 300 peso increase may be imposed on March billings. The Department of Energy or DOE assures the public that they are focusing on issues that may come up during the 20-day maintenance shutdown of the Malampaya Natural Gas Facility from January 28 to February 18, 2017. According to DOE under Secretary Fuentebella, currently they do not see any problems of delays in the upcoming maintenance. Paano natin sisiguruhin yon? Yung binigay natin na January 15, all equipment and facilities should be delivered na kailangan para sa maintenance still on track. Nevertheless, DOE calls on the public to cooperate with the government to prevent price shocks by practicing power conservation in their homes. Nel Maribuhok, UNTV News and Rescue, Taguig City. Organizations that advocate the rights of children argue that putting child offenders in jail is not a solution to help them do away from unlawful acts. Aiko Miguel will tell us why. Sa aming opinion, hindi kulungan ang solusyon sa mga bata nagkakasala sa batas ang pagpaparusa. Kung papasa at papayagan natin pumasa ay mga anak at pamilya ng may hirap, baka ito ang dapat pag-usapan. At hindi yung ikulong ang mga bata. The Child Rights Network, composed of different groups protecting the rights of children, is opposing House Bill No. 2, or the Minimum Age of Criminal Responsibility Act. The bill seeks to lower from 15 years old to 9 years old the criminal liability of children involved in crimes. These are just some of the scenes of a child's condition inside a jail. Thus, the group argues that the government should instead create programs that would help child offenders change. The groups further explain that the solution to the problem is to address poverty and not the imprisonments of children involving crimes who are sometimes being used by criminal syndicates. Meanwhile, UNICEF also stands firm in its position that the Philippine Congress should take into consideration the condition of minors. Bringing a child within the institution of um, the, the criminal justice framework um, increases reoffending. Uh, it increases exposure of the child to more violence. So we really uh, would like to call for Congress to rethink its position and to just push for a stronger support on the implementation of the law. And for parents like Mar, lowering the criminal liability age of child offenders is unreasonable. Sempre kahiyan din ng ano yun ng bata, di ba? Sempre paglaki niya, pag nang ano, naku, nakapatay pala ako ganito. Meanwhile, House Speaker Pantaleon Alvarez clarifies that apprehended child offenders will not be put to jail, but will just be guided by authorities so they could avoid committing another crime in the future. Hindi naman ibig sabihin na yung mga youthful offenders isasama natin sa pihita ng mga hardened criminals. Magkakaroon din tayo ng rehabilitation dyan para naman malaman nila, ah, nine years old, malaman nila na meron silang responsibility to the society. Ay Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Data from the PNP Legal Service reveals that the number of cops facing charges linked to anti-drug operations has increased under the Duterte administration. Lea Ilagan will tell us why. The number of cops seeking help from the PNP Legal Service has increased due to the government's intensified campaigns against illegal drugs. PNP Legal Service Public Information Office Police Superintendent Lineta Deyo says they are assisting 10 policemen from Region 2 and Region 7. This is high compared to only two cops seeking PNP helps prior to the Duterte administration. Tadeo says the cops are facing charges filed by the families of those killed illegitimate PNP anti-drug operations. Ang mga cases po nila is criminal case, walo out of 10 is criminal cases, and two are administrative cases. Tadeo noted that every police who seeks legal assistance has undergone a thorough investigation and assessments. 
This is to ensure that the cops are not abusing and said privilege or have violated PNP operational procedures during the police operations. He added that police with a rank of PO1 to star rank can avail the free legal assistance offered by the PNP. Isa lang naman po yung determination na dapat naming gawin sa mga applicants. Yun po is kung service related ba? Service related ba to? Or kung wala bang mga abuses na nagawa itong aming uh, subject uh, applicants para i-grant namin siya. If the cop's application will be approved, he will be entitled to a direct legal representation. This means a lawyer from the PNP Legal Service will be the one to attend the applicant's court hearing. The cop can also reimburse the legal fee or hire a private lawyer paid by the PNP Legal Service. Today explains they are allowing reimbursement because they lack lawyers at the moment. Meron kaming 96 na lawyers including our director and medyo may kakulangan talaga. Uh, as of now, meron kaming kulang na 190 plus na lawyers. Tadeo meanwhile noted that Police Superintendent Marvin Marcos and his men are not among the caps they are assisting. He has said that aside from the fact that the group did not apply for the free legal assistance, Marcos and his men still have to undergo a strict processing, especially since there are questionable details about their operation at the Bye Bye Sub Provincial Jail where Alvera Leite Mayor Orlando Espinosa Sr. was detained and killed. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue, Camp Krame. The Department of Energy o or DOE has revoked the Standard Compliance Certificate or SCC of the liquefied petroleum gas refilling station in Pasig City that exploded yesterday. Energy Undersecretary Wimpy Fuentabella, or Fuentabella says the refilling station will no longer be allowed to operate following the incident that left many people killed and injured. SEC is a final document an LPG company needs to secure before it could be allowed to operate. And the Department of Energy has already cancelled the standard compliance certificate for the, the operation of this uh, refilling LPG plant. All agencies under the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council or NDRMC have convened today. Brian DePaz will tell us why. Defense Secretary Delphine Lorenzana as the chairman led today's council meeting of member agencies under the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council or NDRRMC. Lorenzana and NEDA Director General Ernesto Perna both believe that continuous onslaught of typhoons or calamities will have an impact to the country's economy. It depends on the intensity of the typhoon or the uh, magnitude of the earthquake and the volcanic eruption. So it's not something that can be de predetermined. Kaya mataas yung ilangat ng ating Colombians because mas kukunti yung tumama sa ating panangis. Dalawang uh, malaklakas lang compared to other to to previous years na sunod-sunod. Thus, the Council emphasized the importance of planning ahead for the calamities and disasters that may hit the Philippines this year. Lorenzana also stressed the significance of addressing the adverse effects of climate change during the meeting. Meanwhile, NDRRMC Executive Director under Secretary Ricardo Halad encourages a collaboration among member agencies to hasten the rehabilitation and recovery efforts for the calamity-stricken communities and typhoon victims last year. For its part, the Department of Foreign Affairs cites the Enhanced Policy Guidelines for Philippine International Humanitarian Assistance. Because of our experience still in Uganda, napakaraming gustong tumulong na uh, medyo nagkagulo yung pagtanggap natin ng mga tulong sa kanila either in kind or in uh, financial form. And so the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs is putting up as an infrastructure so that uh, the uh, Management of these uh, resources will be more uh, above board, transparent, and maayos. 
Meanwhile, Secretary Lorenzana opens a proposal to amend the NDRRMC law in order to make the council a separate department that would focus on disaster and calamity concerns. Kaya, kaya kailangan magkaroon tayo ng isang hensya na tututok day to 24 hours. Ang nangyari ngayon, it's under the defense, yung ako yung chairman niyan. And uh, we have also uh, uh, OCD na 24 hours na kumano dyan, but they are under me. So they still have to uh, consult with me. So we'd like to elevate the OCD into a department level para magkaroon siya na talagang ngipin or teeth to implement yung mga policies natin. Brian De Paz, UNTV News and Rescue, Camp Aguinaldo. Coming up, Pagasa monitors a new low-pressure area located east of Surigao City, Surigao del Norte. And a New Zealand man and his six-year-old daughter have landed in Australia after more than a month at sea. More from Y News after this break. The Philippine Atmospheric Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration or PAGASA is monitoring another low pressure area or LPA. It was estimated at 515 kilometers east of Surigao City, Surigao del Norte. The northeast monsoon is also affecting Luzon based on PAGASA's forecast. Bicol region and the provinces of Aurora and Quezon will experience heavy rains that may trigger flash floods and landslides. Light to moderate rains are expected in the rest of Visayas, Caraga region, and the provinces of Oriental Mindoro, Marinduque, and Romblon. Light rains may also be experienced in Cordillera and Cagayan Valley, while isolated light rains are expected in Metro Manila and the rest of Luzon. The rest of Mindanao will have partly cloudy to cloudy skies with isolated rain showers and thunderstorms. The LPA is expected to cross Visayas by weekend but Pagasa is still monitoring if it will transform into a tropical cyclone. The recent heavy flood in southern Thailand has left farmers struggling to recover from a big loss in production. Kat Dumaraos will tell us why. Farmers in South Thailand have been suffering great losses as the continuous floods have inundated their farmland. As one of the largest rubber producing countries, Thailand's rubber plantations are concentrated in its southern areas. According to the Thai Department of Agriculture, more than 1,600 square kilometers of rubber plantations in southern areas have been flooded, causing losses worth 400 million Thai baht or about 11 million US dollars. The country is also one of the largest palm oil producers in Nakhon Sitamarat, the worst hit area. Almost every household plants and palm trees have suffered various degrees of damage from the flooding. Local residents have moved their livestock to higher ground after their houses were flooded. They said if the flooding continues, not only will their daily necessities dwindle, but they will also run short on fodder for the livestock. The country's livestock department said about 550,000 livestock have been transferred from flood-stricken areas and it will distribute 300,000 kilograms of fodder to flood victims. Kat Numaraos, UNTV News and Rescue, Bangkok, Thailand. Republicans pass a bill that seeks to reform abusive U.S. regulations. James Buntuyan will tell us why. Republicans on Wednesday passed a bill in the House of Representatives that touch on nearly every step U.S. agencies take in creating and applying new rules, continuing their blitz to radically reform abusive federal regulation of areas from the environment to the workplace. In a 238-183 vote, the House passed the Regulatory Accountability Act, which combined eight bills aimed at changing how the vast government bureaucracy runs. Only five Democrats voted for it. 
The legislation would give President-elect Donald Trump tools to wipe out abusive regulation. The move is in accordance with the many House leaders calling for lighter regulation and saying the cost to comply with federal rules are too high. Republicans say there is little accountability for regulations that apply to almost every aspect of American life because they are created by appointed officials and not elected representatives. Federal agencies operate either independently or under the president's authority. James Montuyan, UN TV News and Rescue, Maryland, USA. Meanwhile, President Rodrigo Duterte's name was mentioned during the confirmation hearing of the appointees to the Trump administration by the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee. U.S. Secretary of State nominee Rex Tillerson was asked by Senator Marco Rubio about his views on whether the Duterte administration's bloody war on drugs was conducive to human rights violations and something that should be condemned. In response, Tillerson said he believes he needs to gather more facts on the issue, though he stressed that he was not disputing the information cited by the senator. A famous French artist brings the horrific picture of a migrant crisis to central Paris. Jovic Barmas will tell us why. French artist Pierre Delevingne brought the European refugee crisis to the heart of Paris. On Wednesday, he placed a hanging giant poster depicting the sinking of a vessel fully loaded with migrants from the embankment of the River Seine, based on a real photograph taken in the Mediterranean by Italian coast guards. Delevingne's work shows migrants stumbling overboard as the boat capsizes, with an optical illusion suggesting the sinking is happening on the Seine itself. Cette œuvre qui effectivement, qu'est-ce qu'elle dit Elle dit, Elle dit euh, voilà, ça se passe en Méditerranée, et en fait là, ça se passe ici. C'est juste à côté. Voilà. Mais voilà. Et d'ailleurs, j'ai au point que j'ai rajouté des personnages euh, dans, dans, le, dans, dans, cette, dans, ce, dans cette œuvre que j'ai photographiée, qui sont nous, qui sont des gens dit, de, des Parisiens, pour dire en fait, eux, c'est nous. De Levy worked with the NGO, the Office for the Welcome of and Assistance for Migrants, or BAAM, to install the poster. The group lobbies European governments to allow migrants freer access to the continent, opposing systems including the EU-Turkey deal, which sees boatloads of migrants intercepted and returned. Mayor of Paris Anne Hidalgo has opened a high-profile welcome center for refugees in the north of the capital, with a second set to open next week. According to figures published by the International Organization for Migration, 7,495 refugee and migrant deaths were recorded worldwide last year almost a third higher than in 2015, with the vast majority perishing in the Mediterranean. Jovic Burmas, UNTV News and Rescue, Europe. A dog meat farm owner decides to quit business and surrenders all 200 dogs to authorities. Eric Ferrer will tell us why. International animal rights activists rescued 10 canines from a dog farm in Wonjo on Tuesday as part of its campaign to end the dog meat trade in South Korea. The owner of the farm, who has been in the business for 30 years and declined to be identified, cited declining health as a reason for getting out of the business. Ten dogs were rescued from a farm where 200 of them were being raised for human consumption to start new lives as pets under the organization's campaign. As airline flights can only carry a limited number of dogs per day, it will take a couple of weeks for HSI to rescue all 200 of the dogs from the farm. But as soon as they are available for adoption, we find that there are lineups of people, literally people will line up at shelters in the U.S. to adopt these dogs because people are so um, engaged by their, their sad and, and compelling stories. The farm 87 kilometers from Seoul is the sixth that HSI has helped close down in the country since 2015 and follows six months of negotiation, medical examinations and vaccinations. Plumbee says hygiene is non-existent in the area. 
So in South Korea is really the only place where I've seen these sorts of farms, where dogs are kept on farms. Um, I've done work in China, and in China, um, it's a lot of rounding up of stray dogs or stealing people's pet dogs is really what feeds the industry, and it's very similar in Vietnam. Consumption of dog meat is on the decline in South Korea, where it's mainly eaten by older people and dogs are increasingly popular as pets. Still, HSI estimates that there are 17,000 dog meat farms in South Korea, and dog meat is especially popular during summer. The Humane Society hopes the government moves to ban the breeding of dogs for meat ahead of the 2018 Winter Olympics to be held in the country. Eric Ferrer, UNTV News and Rescue, South Korea. A New Zealand man and his six-year-old daughter have landed in Australia after being missing at sea for more than a month. Nina Bascon tells us why. A New Zealand man and his six-year-old daughter missing at sea for more than a month have landed in Australia after sailing their small, damaged yacht across a treacherous 2,000 kilometers of Tasman Sea. Alan Langdon, 46, and his daughter Q had planned a short journey from Kauai to the Bay of Islands on New Zealand's east coast. But after a storm damaged the yacht's rudder, they found themselves drifting out to sea. Langdon, an experienced sailor, says he had originally planned to sail to the Bay of Islands in New Zealand. But after stormy weather damaged his boat's rudder, he decided it would be safer to continue on to Australia. We were in a position with no rudder, we didn't have as many options and we waited for the weather. Like a the Tasman Sea is considered a difficult crossing due to the often stormy weather that plagues the ocean. Local resident Christine Davidson says she saw the pair dock. I could tell that they'd been at sea for quite a while. They'd um, yeah, quite wobbly on, on the land and their arrival in Australia ends an international search for the pair. Landon will spend a few days in Aladola fixing the broken rudder before sailing north to Port Kamla to be processed by Australian customs. Nina Bascon, UNTV News and Rescue, Melbourne, Australia. Organizers of the four-yearly Vindy Globe prepares as the race enters its final week. Meanwhile, Togo gears up ahead of the African Cup in Gabon. Aaron Romero tells us why. Togo's soccer team, the Sparrow Hawks, are in their final preparations ahead of the 2017 African Cup of Nations, which kicks off this Saturday, January 14, in Gabon. Togo will compete in the tough Group C category alongside African Cup defending champions Ivory Coast, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Morocco and will be led by team captain Emmanuel Adebayor. We will not tell the story of those who want to believe that we are going to win a title of the champion. It's a little bit of what. We are not going to learn, as I hear sometimes. We are going to play, to pose the problems of the adversaries, to win the matches, if we can win them. But we are very lucid on the gap that today is separated by some teams like the Côte d'Ivoire, the Maroc and the RDC. The Sparrow Hawks were once seen as one of Africa's top teams but have struggled in recent years due to poor management. This year's edition of the biennial tournament will be held for three weeks and ends on February 5. Meanwhile, the leaders of one of the world's major yacht races, the four-yearly Vendée Globe, entered the final week of the sailing challenge on Wednesday, January 11. The solo non-stop round-the-world race is notorious for putting its participants through some of the toughest sailing conditions in the world. Noticeably, the Southern Ocean and the wild seas around Cape Horn, the southern tip of South America. French skipper Armel Leclerc was on Wednesday morning ahead of Briton Alex Thompson. Thompson was able to edge closer to Leclerc after days of painful progress through the doldrums. The leaders of the race, which began on November 6, are expected to return to Les Sables de Lone on the west coast of France from next week. Aaron Romero, UNTV News and Rescue, New York. Those are the reasons behind the news, January 12, 2017. I'm Angelo Castro III.
Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. I'm Darlene Basingan. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Thank you for watching Why News.